can't pound Peter this morning in your New Testament, near the end of your New Testament. So if you'd like to turn there, you can do that at this time, Second Peter. Failed to mention in our prayer request section that we're thankful for answered prayers too. And because of little difficulties in the hospital and then because of COVID, it's been a while since we've seen the Burtons. And this is the first Sunday here for Corbin Burton. We're thankful for that. Thankful that they're here with us. They've been, I know, with, with uh, Ashley's family the past couple of months since the COVID restrictions have set in place. But we're thankful that they're here with us this morning and thankful he's out and about and doing so good and growing strong. So be sure to say hello to them from a distance this morning. And we're so thankful he continues to grow in, in his health. You may have heard, and we hear often even about the slippery slope, the, the warning about the slippery slope that one false step might lead to another false step, a small step at a time. We think about sometimes the analogy or the metaphor about the frog, right? You don't throw a frog in boiling water, you incrementally increase the temperature for going to boil a frog. From a philosophy, ph philosophical standpoint, there's this paradox that really describes that same principle, the same principle of incremental loss over time. And the paradox highlights something like a, a heap of sand. You could do it with sand on the beach. You could do it with the ocean and, and water out of the ocean. And, and what, what happens is the philosophers will kind of say, well, if you take one grain away from the heap, is it still a heap of sand? And you would say, well, sure, absolutely. Well, once you accept and acknowledge that truth, mathematically then what happens is that you have to accept that it doesn't matter how many grains you remove, eventually it's still always a heap, even past the point of our obvious sight and, and recognition knowing that it's not really a heap. Mathematically, you could say that one gram of sand is a heap even though it's not. That's why it's called a paradox. It's tension. The, the question is, how many grains can you remove and it still be a heap of sand? When we think about that slippery slope, incremental loss over time, we think about the, the degradation that happens over time. Peter writes the book of 2 Peter knowing that that is a possibility. That's possible. We can be led astray. We can lose our stability. What we're going to notice this morning is that if we were to confront Peter and ask Peter about this paradox, how many grains can you take away and still maintain the identity as a heap? How much can we lose without losing it all? How close can we get, right, that, that way of thinking? Peter would tell us that's the wrong way of thinking. That's a fleshly way of thinking. That is incomplete because the key to overcoming the slippery slope, the key to overcoming this incremental loss over time it's not merely to focus on the loss. It's not merely to, to kind of play the game of self-preservation. In fact, the answer to that dilemma is to add. To add. Think about how that question of how many grains can you lose and it still be a heap, that is undermined if we say, how about we just keep adding grains to the heap? The way to overcome that potential, that temptation to be drawn away gradually is to, in fact, go the other direction and to add to keep on growing. That's what Peter's going to write in this letter. And why is that important at this season and this course of study? What we've understood over the past couple of weeks is that we are born into a nation, the United States of America. We are born into a state, the state of Alabama. We're born into a county, and, and we are citizens civically of these earthly entities, earthly kingdoms. But for those who obey Christ and are Christians, we are born into the heavenly kingdom. Philippians 3 and verse 20, we are citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, and it's from heaven we await our Savior, Jesus Christ. What we must understand is that as we live as earthly citizens with civic opportunities and civic responsibilities, we're allowing and we must allow that heavenly citizenship and heavenly values to guide and direct us in our earthly citizenship. So it's natural. We might ask this question, what next? No matter what happens this week and the weeks to come, the months to come, no, no matter what happens if there is a transition of power or, or no matter what happens if there is a continuation of power, what next for us as citizens of heaven who are also citizens of earth? And what's interesting, I think, in terms of kind of aligning the context here is Peter is writing, Peter is writing 2 Peter, 
to remind them that he's about to leave. He's anticipating the future. And he's writing and telling them, here's what you must do in the future, even though I am not going to be with you in that future. So you look at verses 12 through 15 of First Peter chapter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, excuse me, the first chapter. He says, I'm writing these things to stir you up by way of reminder. And he acknowledges, you already know them, but you must keep growing in them. And he says, the Lord has told me what, what, what my future holds. He knows he's going to die, and he's going to die at the hands of a ruthless emperor, Emperor Nero. But he says, I'm going to make every effort to keep putting these things before you so that you can at any time recall these things, even after I am long gone. He's preparing them for the future. They might be asking, what next? What next as the generations change? What next as Rome changes? What next? And Peter's response in this letter will help us to anticipate that same question ourselves. What next after Tuesday and after this year, 2020? What next as we keep growing in our civic responsibilities and as we keep growing in our heavenly citizenship? What next? As we think about his response, we need to be clear that, that he does understand the power, the potential for that slippery slope process. And he makes clear there are threats. But despite living in a time under a ruthless government, he says there's, there's an even greater threat to your souls. You'll notice how he makes it clear these enemies, these threats, are often difficult to perceive. He says they come at you with cleverly devised myths. They secretly will bring in these teachings. They're deceptive words to be aware of. They're, they're operating off of instinct. They're trying to entice and lure you. They're twisting truth. Peter's saying, even though there are rightfully in their time government concerns, the greatest concern, the greatest threat are the swirling culture of false teachings around them. Their hearts are what are at stake. And so while we do have legitimate, founded concerns about what might happen in our nation, we must be clear that the greatest threat is that of culture as it relates to our souls. And what's interesting, when you study the relationship between culture and politics and culture and government, culture always drives the ship. Politicians and government officials are always reacting to what is happening in culture. So we must be on guard not just because of these political and, and policy-driven kind of results. Our hearts must be in tune to how culture is shifting and changing and swirling all around us. These are the types of threats that Peter warns about in this letter of 2 Peter. We're not going to wake up one day and somebody just kind of automatically or, or randomly even kind of say, you know, Christians, I'm not, I'm not a fan of them. I don't like them. Let's, let's just decide today to harm them. It's going to happen over time. It's gradual. That's why we do have the concerns like this slippery slope way of thinking. And so we must be on guard to constantly be aware of the cultural forces that are driving some of that, those efforts that might end up resulting in persecution or other things that would harm us. Are our souls, are we in view of all of this, knowing that our souls are what's most important and our souls are what at stake. What would he tell them? What would he tell us today? What's next? Well, remember, as Rick prayed this morning, remember God is in control and he tells them that and it's clear that God is in control. Look at the outset of this kind of main paragraph we're looking at this morning in 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at the promises he's given us in verse 4. He has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. He is in control and he allows us to have relationship with him. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You hear what he's granted to us, given to us? We're not fighting to escape corruption as much as we are to preserve the escape he has already given us. We don't have to go far. We don't have to look long. To find examples of corruption that happens because of sin, what does Peter tell us? God's already given us escape from those forces of corruption. Yes, he is in control. You get to chapter 2 and he highlights this control even more because he says God has shown his ability and willingness and power 
to punish those who do wrong. He punished the angels who left him, who rebelled against him, who undermined his authority. He punished the ancient world who was always evil continually, the Genesis record would say. He punished Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. In the midst of those, he also delivered and rescued the righteous. He rescued Noah and his seven family members. He rescued righteous Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. And so it's because of those facts that he says in 2 verse 9, the Lord then knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. We must know when we get to know, we get to remember every day, always, that God is in control. That never changes. That's never up for discussion. That means that we are safe in his arms if we are his children. We are living righteously and faithfully before him. But I want us to be clear about how Peter constructs this letter. Peter doesn't say that God is in control just as a shrug off statement to just accept what's going on around us. It's an anchoring truth. So think about how that happens sometimes in election season. We get concerned about things. We think maybe a candidate's going to win or maybe a candidate does win that we don't, we don't think has the right values. And sometimes, not all the time, not every time this is said, but sometimes we might just shrug it off and say, well, God's in control anyway. And that becomes an excuse for us to essentially be lazy. Peter's doing the exact opposite. He's going to show us that diligence is necessary because of what God has already given us. Diligence is the response to knowing that God is in control. Even though we are living in a, a world and in times when there are forces swirling around us trying to undermine God's goodness in our lives. Listen to what he says then in verses 8 through 10 about diligence. If these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these things, you will never fall. Then verse 11, he will provide you with that entrance in the eternal, everlasting kingdom. We must be diligent, knowing that God, yes, has secured our salvation. And it's within this world that we exercise spiritual devotion and spiritual diligence in all things. So he does that. He makes this imperative command to be diligent by referencing these qualities. Verse 8, what are these qualities? They go back to verse 5 of chapter 1. For this very reason, the escape, the great promises of verse 4, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement, add to. Remember the sand illustration? How are we combating the, the slippery slope possibility? We're combating by adding. We're adding grains. We're adding grains as we keep on growing. Add to. So for this very reason, add to your faith with virtue or supplement your faith with virtue. Your virtue with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness steadfastness with godliness godliness with brotherly affection or brotherly kindness brotherly affection with love it's diligence and it's diligence by means of this process of constantly adding and that is what growth looks like it's to constantly keep on adding we think about those qualities and how these are the core of what Peter is reminding them about. If you practice these, and if they are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective. No matter the environment around you, they keep you from being drawn away, from having those grains taken away from your life. Why are they so important? And let's challenge ourselves this morning, this time, this season right now. Why are they so important right now? First, why is faith so important? Why is the starting point of our faith so important? It is our supreme trust in God. Faith is trusting God and trusting God more than anything or anyone else. Trusting him throughout anything else. It's keeping our eyes focused in on Jesus Christ, his son, through anything and throughout everything we must face. We must understand that whether this nation suffers or thrives, nothing can rob us of our faith, our trust in God. Whether this nation decides to glorify God or blaspheme God, it cannot keep us from our faith and trust 
being rooted in God. And there's no leader we can elect who can keep us from having faith in God. There's no leader who could usurp authority and take over, take the throne by some coup and just completely change this nation who can then force us to change the object of our trust. The object of our trust and faith is always God, his son, Jesus Christ. When Peter opens the letter, he says to you who are like precious faith, the King James Version and other translations like it, ESV says, who are in equal standing as him. What Peter is saying is that your faith is just as valuable as his faith. Faith is valuable and it's precious. It's through this faith and trust that he gives us these great and precious promises. So our faith is worth preserving and protecting and thus it's worth adding to this process of growth. Then he says you supplement, you add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is moral courage, moral excellence. It's deciding, deciding to decide, deciding to step out, deciding to speak out, deciding to speak up. It's having gumption, we might say. Just that, that boldness to just do and to keep doing and to keep doing and deciding to do. It's a civic value that our founders listed from time to time as being core and key to, to our nation's leaders possessing virtue. And it was core for our citizens to possess virtue, that liberty and freedom cannot be protected and sustained the more we depart from virtuous desires. And one thing that I've thought about the past couple weeks especially is maybe regrettably, we who know the truth who know Jesus Christ, have obeyed him, or are trying to live responsibly and, and live righteously before God, we have all these blessings he's given us. And yet how often do we allow those with an immoral perspective, a perspective that denies God, that's godless, that's ungodly, do we allow them to show more backbone with how they live and how they push for things than how we do, how we choose to live with the truth? The excellence, the moral courage that we have comes from God. Peter uses the same word in 1 verse 3. He says, God has given to us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Same word as virtue. So when we think about backbone and boldness and gumption and, and getting things done, the right things done, that comes from God. And we must have the boldness that comes from him. Virtue, having this, this unquench, unquenchable desire to just simply do what's right always. You'll notice, as a bridge to the next one, you'll notice it precedes knowledge. That might kind of catch us off guard. If we were writing this, we might think, well, knowledge needs to come first. But Peter says, no, no, you need virtue. You must have the desire and the commitment to do what's right even before you learn and know what it is. Because we can be so fleshly that we might turn to Scripture and we might decide, is this something I'm willing to do or not? And then issue by issue, we pick and choose our faithfulness. Peter says, you put this moral courage and excellence first before knowledge so that you will carry out and live out everything that God communicates to you in his word. And so we must add knowledge. Knowledge is absolutely necessary. We cannot escape these issues of corruption and escape these threats without truth, without knowledge. Truth always frees. Untruth, a lack of truth, ignoring truth will always imprison us. And it's in these election seasons so often when people are so self-preservation kind of thinking and, and often manipulative and framing that we must be extra disciplined and especially intentional to know what is not only the truth about those matters, we talked about that some last week, but especially to know that God's truth is always greater. Psalm number one, there's a man who's blessed. Blessed is the man who does not progress through sin. Why does that happen? It's because his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. We can't get out of this world without just understanding and knowing what's going on around us. Yes, daily news, those kind of things. But the most important knowledge must always be the knowledge from God. 
And that knowledge must frame our understanding of any other kind of knowledge. So to grow and to add to our grains, to add to our heap, is to ensure that we're growing in the knowledge of God. At the very end of this book, we mentioned that Peter is concerned about the slippery slope. He's concerned about losing our stability. That's 3 in verse 17. Take care that you don't listen to these forces, these resources that are trying to come after you. You, you might lose your soul. You might lose your stability. And the response, verse 18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must keep growing and adding the knowledge of God to our lives, especially during this season. We think about the importance of self-control. That's putting up boundaries that come from God. It's having the gumption to follow that path, but then self-control is to maintain the boundaries, to stay within them. And when we think about tense seasons and seasons of drama and anxiety, it's often in those seasons that we are the most vulnerable to losing our self-control. As our emotions rise, we can, we can lose self-control quickly. And when we lose self-control, we risk losing it all. We cannot be taken advantage of because we are undisciplined and lack self-control and self-discipline. In the face of personal fear about his ministry, Paul would write to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, God's not given us a spirit of fear but that of power, love, and self-control. Timothy, you've got to be disciplined. You've got to have a sound mind, clear thinking, and you've got to keep being disciplined to put those things into practice. But then we must add to it self-control. We must add to it self Excuse me, steadfastness, endurance, keeping on, keeping on. That's to say we've got this right trajectory, this right path, the right boundaries, and there's nothing that's going to keep us from following through with that path every day, always, no matter what, no matter who, no matter when. Steadfastness is the endurance to keep putting them into practice. When you take the key word of diligence that we've observed is in this book, used several times, diligence, Diligence is basically the combination of virtue and steadfastness. It's the desire, the eagerness to keep doing, and it's the steadfastness, the endurance to keep on doing it, no matter what. So Peter says if you're going to add to your faith, you're going to overcome this draw away from God, you must add steadfastness and endurance. And even though there are scary times and scary people, no one can rob us of our steadfastness and endurance. And you'll find throughout Scripture that suffering is often pictured as a necessary, a necessary good because it builds steadfastness and endurance. Romans chapter 5 tells us that suffering produces endurance. The same word, steadfastness, suffering produces steadfastness. Steadfastness or endurance produces character, and character produces hope. When we long for the hopes of heaven, we long for the hopes of God, those come by building our steadfastness and building our character through that steadfastness and endurance. So if there's ever a season to be steadfast and to, to not waver, it's this season. But then there's the need to practice our faithfulness in a public way. It's what Peter calls godliness in this list. We build our souls. We build them to be stable. We build them ourselves. We build them in our families. And then we live out that faithfulness before all. There must be a public display to all that we do. And that's especially important because I, I, I'm sure you're like most of us, I'm sure you're like me, and, and realize that there's some concerns, politically speaking, really no matter how things turn out with the election, right? When it comes to our ability, our freedoms, our liberties to carry out our faithfulness in a public way, those might be challenged no matter how things turn out. And so we must be aware that God always expects for us to live these things out publicly. But we give him the first line of advice. He's the one that tells us what to do, not just experts, not just po politicians, not just those with the money and fueling industries. But instead, we live out publicly what we know to be true and what we've committed to living out. It will meet resistance? Yes, that's why steadfastness is necessary. But here's why we must live it out publicly. Private faithfulness, kept to ourselves faithfulness, will never change the world. It'll never help those who need to know the gospel. And so we've been told over and over again to live out our faith publicly because we live in a world that is dark, therefore it needs light. We live in a world that is decaying, and it needs salt to preserve it. 
So that's why Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men. It must be lived out publicly. We must keep adding to our lives that public display of our faithfulness. But then he says to add to your godliness that of brotherly kindness or brotherly affection. That's so important anytime because people are always hurting. And while the pandemic in the past several months has been difficult, while the divisiveness of election seasons are difficult, maybe they highlight or they take advantage of people's pain and hurt, we must understand that from time beginning, there have always been needs and people hurting. So God has told his people, you be the kind of people that are always looking out for and then acting on opportunities to serve and to help with kindness those who are struggling. We think about the difficulties of the pandemic, but also that of election season, how hospitality is magnified right now. You take someone who, who might judgment about someone else based on kind of a political affiliation or who they might vote for, and then we come along and just because we follow Christ and he's our Savior, we show kindness and affection toward them, and they're caught off guard. You mean you would show kindness to me? Well, yes, because I follow Christ, and he's shown us kindness. How much more does a, a car ride to a stranded motorist mean in the middle of a pandemic? See how that brings on extra risk? But how great of a difference we then make when we're showing brotherly kindness to people in difficult times? The Christians of the first century, when the letter of Hebrews was written, they were facing struggling times. It was costing some of them. They were falling back. What we know is chapter 13 begins with the words, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. All seasons are opportunities to show brotherly kindness and affection and hospitality to others in need. So we must add that to our lives constantly to keep growing and to keep growing in God. Then he says to add to that, the chief supreme value of love. We add to this Philadelphia brotherly love. We add to this love, agape love, supreme love, the quality that God is. God is love. We open with this paradox about the sand. It's interesting, love is a paradox in many ways because God commands this of every Christian to love with sacrificial love. And yet it's also the most difficult pursuit we will ever endeavor upon to show the love of God. No matter the difficulties, no matter those who would harm us, to show constant love, to not grow weary, to not grow resentful, but instead to show love. And in John 15, there's a paragraph where Jesus, he's preparing the disciples, the apostles specifically, for him to leave. He's anticipating a similar transition as Peter was anticipating, right? He's going to leave. Here's the future without me. And there's a paragraph in John chapter 15 where in a short seven or eight verse stretch, he mentions hate about seven or eight times. You're going to face a world of hate. Just as the world hates me, they will hate you. And he closes that section and he reminds them they're fulfilling scripture because they're hating me without a cause. So when they hate you, will it always be justified? No. You want to know how he precedes that paragraph? Listen to what he says. Immediately before he says, now listen, you're going to live in times that are defined by hate. Here's what he says. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. He's priming the well. Before, you, before I have to tell you you're going to be hated, remember you must love. But there's so much hate. There's hate on every side and every direction. And all I hear and all I feel is just this against, against, against. It's hate. It's hate. Jesus says, that's why you love. You must love. And you love as I have loved you. Is that scary? Does that bring on fear? Certainly. It induces fear. Any of these things in an environment where, where faithfulness is challenged and it's not understood, it's going it, it to have the potential to bring on fear. But the same disciple, the same apostle who recorded those words of Jesus in John 15 also wrote in 1 John chapter 4 this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. 
we love because he first loved us. And verse 19 is so crucial to understanding verse 18. We can say that love is the answer to fear and the answer to overcoming fear because Jesus Christ has already removed our greatest sources of fear and he did so precisely through his love. And when all of the world that does not understand would challenge us and, and try to nitpick us and say, well, you can't do that and you can't say that and, and yeah, all, all this kind of stuff, we can always come back to and say, but we can love. And I am going to love. And we are going to love. And we are going to love because Jesus Christ first loved us. And that very well may be the bridge for us to be able to tell them and show them this Jesus Christ loved you first as well. So how do we avoid the slippery slope? How do we avoid these swirling winds around us? What next? When things change, when transitions happen, what, what next when we're a little afraid, maybe a lot afraid? Peter says you keep adding. You ensure you grow and you add to. You add to your precious faith all of these qualities that God has made clear to you. That way you're fruitful. And that way you can enjoy the promise of heaven. This morning... If that promise of heaven is not yours, if you're not a citizen of heaven, please do not leave with that still being the case. Please be a citizen. Decide to, to be born again, to be born into a new life where you put sin to death, you, you choose and decide to repent, you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're immersed in water where he forgives, where you are born again and become the citizen of heaven where you can confidently anticipate your Savior, Jesus Christ. Let today be that day. November 1st, 2020. A year that so many have, have already kind of decided to label as, as something terrible. It can be the best year. The year you decide to obey Jesus Christ where he forgives. Maybe you need to respond and come back to him. There's never, um, never a time that that's not possible. So thankful for the courage that, that Roy and Sheila's statement makes and shows, it displays, because it was not on a Sunday that they reached out and said we need to repent. And they weren't even in the county. They're, they're separated a great distance. Brother Roy's sick, and yet they still made sure there was no hurdle between them and us and them and God. And this morning, you can do the same. We beg of you. We encourage you. We're here to love you if you need to make those things right. If you need to do so, do so.